Welcome to the Mad Max Minute presents Waterworld H2O Minutes at a Time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we are talking about Minutes 9 and 10, which begin with the Trimoran in a race for the float bag, and it ends with the Mariner traveling to the Atoll mentioned by the Drifter. Between Episode 4, when I was so happy to announce that I had gotten my hands on the novelization, and here... We watched a video by a guy named Leighton Eversall on YouTube. It's a very good video. He goes into a whole lot more detail behind the production of Waterworld than we ever did. But it was in that video that I discovered that the book that I bought, the 121-page novelization, was the YA version, and that there exists a version of this book that is at least 100 pages longer which thoroughly upset me because I felt like I had been lied to. I bought the novelization. It was not the real novelization. It was the dumbed-down baby version. (laughs) So I went looking for the full 260-page real version, and it was like 20 bucks more than what I spent on this baby version. So I'm just going to hold on to the version I have and not worry. (laughs) about the big one. I did, however, buy another book that was mentioned in that video. It was the Making of Waterworld companion book, and it's one of those big, hey, these are the production designs for the Atoll and the costumes and things like that. So I'm excited to get that, but I'm also equally devastated that I did not get the full novelization because I am going to be pulling from the novelization very heavily in the next couple of episodes. At least. You were not the only one who was duped, (laughs) who was confused. As soon as the video, the YouTube video that we were watching mentioned that there were two different books, I jumped on Amazon and read a couple of reviews from people who were like, yeah, I thought I was getting the longer one, but turned out I was getting the smaller one. So I was a little bit disappointed. This one is fine, but I'm going to go back and try and get the other one again. So there... In general, there is confusion about the two different versions. Not 100% sure why there are two different versions. Maybe reading the longer version will make it obvious why there is a young adult version. I'm wondering if the regular version is (laughs) R-rated. And the version you have, the young adult version, is more PG-13 rated. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. But aside from bemoaning my fate... When it comes to the book, we do have actual movie to talk about. So we're kicking off today right where we left off last time with the Mariner in a race to get the float bag before the smokers can get to it. I want to note in one of the opening shots of this chunk that the Mariner does that thing that he does where he's holding on to the helm and he shifts his hands to turn the helm into a crank. And I don't know... Why exactly? But that's probably one of my favorite moves that he does in this movie. And I think it just might be akin to when someone hops into a plane and starts flipping switches. Like they know exactly what to do. And I love that. Yeah. Also reminds me of when kids or adults are play driving. Mm -hmm. They always shift gears like they're driving an automatic (laughs) when especially kids have no earthly idea what that means and wouldn't be able to do it in a real car. Honestly, half adults don't know either. But that's like the fun part of driving is moving things Mm -hmm. where most of driving and most of sailing and most of flying a plane is just keeping still, keeping steady. (laughs) (laughs) But those aren't the fun parts. No. Another thing I like about the fact that he shifts his hands and it turns into a crank is that it's another example of how you can have this massive boat and it's just the one guy who's able to control it. It's because he's built so many functions into this one workstation. 
Very true. And while you were prepping for the next few episodes, I don't know exactly what episode it was, you mentioned that you had found for sale a toy trimaran yeah. from the movie. You can and get it on Amazon, apparently. Yeah. One of the fun things about toys is what you can move and what you can change. That's the play part of toys. Mm -hmm. So this is a play feature, and it's fun. I should note that in the toy version, which was produced by Kenner, who made a lot of the early Star Wars action figures and stuff, the mast extends so you can collapse the mast down for trawling mode and pull it up for sailing mode. It's got the spinning blades of the windmill that you can spin around. It has the ability for you to stash the sail in the center hull. Like, it's got a lot of play features. And the thing is massive. It's that like 20 me. inches wide. It's actually not that expensive. The listing that I found on Amazon, it was like a little under 30 bucks. But I was surprised you didn't go for it. Yeah, I'm not jonesing for it. Yeah. It's not something I'm chomping at the bit for. But it would be kind of cool. I think what you'd have to do is you'd have to buy it and then paint it up so it looks nice. Because it does not look that great in its toy form. It's all these different colored plastics. It Much needs... like the boat in the movie. Oh, no, no, no. It's worse than the boat in the movie. Okay. That's saying something because this boat's pretty ugly. Yeah. Like you would have to paint it up to look like the boat in the movie. Okay. <laughs> also in that video that we watched, they talked for a few minutes about the company that made the Trimoran the two copies of the Trimoran that they had, that they were a very high-end, very professional, very design-oriented yacht manufacturer. And they showed at least one picture that I remember of one of their boats. And they are beautiful. Mm -hmm. They are absolutely gorgeous and sleek and well-designed. And everything that this boat is not... And it's a shame. Well, it's thoroughly post-apocalyptic. It is. It's exactly what it's supposed to be. Yeah. It's the same thing that happened to all of the gorgeous machines that were in the Mad Max movies. Yes. I'm sure there are people, <laughs> plenty of people who are really into cars who see those run-down, makeshift, patches, cars that are classics that just aren't what they were meant to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a shame. It's sad. So the smokers comment that, come on, he's going to get it. Like, they have to hurry up and get to the bag. So this kind of surprised me a little bit. Mm -hmm. In the last set of minutes, it felt like the point was to commandeer the trimaran, to steal its supplies, to kill its pilot, to take it. Now it seems like their goal is the bag. The bag itself. And it kind of feels like it was always the bag. I have to wonder, are they concerned about him picking up the bag because it means that once he has the bag, he's going to make a run for it? And so that if they reach the bag first, they can intercept him and keep him from running away with his spoils? I feel like the bag represents a possibility for them to get something without effort. Mm, that is very true. They watched the trimaran turn from trawler mode into speed mode yep so maybe they are smart enough to readjust their expectations yeah like okay i don't think we're gonna get this boat but we could get the bag mm -hmm. plus there's the strategic advantage of getting between the boat and the float bag yes. for sure and if the bag is important enough to the mariner to not run straight away but to risk getting it well gosh what's in that bag exactly one thing that I really like that the Mariner does is he locks the main helm in such a way that he's able to run to, it is, I want to say, the starboard float? Yeah, it's the starboard side. He runs over and he takes hold of this pole that is extending up out of the float. And we're going to realize in a little while that that's just an extension of the tiller for the main rudder in the middle of the boat. And I think it's so cool that... He has built into this boat ways that he can be in other parts of the boat and still have control over it. He's been alone a long time. I think that's the story that we are meant to gather from what tidbits we're getting from the boat. That he has been alone for a long time and has adapted to it quite nicely. 
And I love how when you get that wide shot of the trimaran when it's closing in on the float bag, it's cool for one because you've got trimaran coming from one angle and you've got the smokers coming from the other angle. And if you look closely at the back of that starboard float, you can see the mariner and he pulls on that tiller really hard and the boat with perfect response cuts this really hard angle to loop in around the float bag and it is so cool just to see the boat respond so perfectly like that my absolute favorite part of this two minute chunk that we're talking about is when he leans over the edge Mm -hmm. and scoops up the bag it's the culmination of this perfect maneuver that he has been working on and it was all for this moment and it works and it's beautiful and graceful Yeah, it's nice. And it's great also because when he grabs the bag, the smokers are still really far away. Like there was no chance for them to catch up. He has this so under control. He is so under control that he even has time to move against the other drifter. Mm -hmm. So great. Okay, so I was watching this scene with him leaning over, grabbing the bag, coming back up. And as soon as he has the bag on board, they cut back to another wide shot, which is just a continuation of that hard cut. And wouldn't you know, because I was looking so closely at this, if you look over to the left side of the screen, there's a float bag still in the water. Oh, there is! It's on screen for roughly a full second. It's like 24 frames, and that's a full second in movie time. But I think one of the reasons they didn't go through the effort of airbrushing it out or anything like that has to do with shot composition. Because you remember, we're working with Dean Semler, who shot the Mad Max movies. And the Mad Max movies are all about directing focus and making sure that the viewer is looking at the correct thing. So if you go to the shot before the wide, that's the one where the Mariner comes up with the pulley and he gets back onto the boat and drops the bag off of his shoulder. At the end of that shot, the Mariner is off on the right side of the screen and he's partially obscured by this post. So all of our attention is on the right side of the screen because he was the movement in that shot. He was coming up off the side and moving. And so all of the viewership is focused on that right side of the screen. So we smash cut to the wide shot and all of our focus is on the right side of the screen. Naturally, because we're just looking at water there, our eyes are going to drift back to center frame looking for some action. And because the trimaran is the first thing we run into and it is moving from left to right, our focus is going to stay right of center on the screen. So that way we are very unlikely, unless you're obsessive like we are, you're very unlikely to see that float bag still in the water. Yeah, and that's why you hire Dean Semler. (laughs) Exactly. So they didn't have to spend the extra money shopping out that float. Because heaven knows they spent enough money on this movie. They did not need to keep spending money like that, hand over fist. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And to prove the point, I watched these minutes through a dozen or more times. Never did I notice it. Never. And you only noticed it because you're a frame-by-frame type of guy. Mm -hmm. I am not. So... Dean Semler doing his job. Yep. So when the Mariner gets back to the helm, he's got the float bag and he throws it down on the floor. If you go frame by frame, like you said I do, you can actually see the thigh master in the netting. Oh, you can? Yeah. Nice. It's going to show up later on when he reveals his wares to the atoll. And I think it also comes up in a later scene after that. But I was confused because I thought there was a lot more stuff in that netting. And then I realized the previous shot of the netting that we saw was... A pretty close in zoom like the netting bag was about the same size as the float bag and for some reason I thought the netting was a lot bigger but no it's about equal size so him throwing that bag down that's pretty on par for what was floating up from the bottom okay so with the float bag in possession it's now time to focus on the problem of smokers being on his tail and these guys are focused now fully on the trimaran Their distance is not so much of a concern. What's a concern is their ability to not rely on the wind. Mm -hmm. And they also, I believe, have firearms, right? Oh, yes. They've got guns. They have machine guns. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't necessarily need to get that close to him to cause him problems. Bodily harm. 
I was wondering about the speed difference between the trimaran and the jet skis, because I'm pretty sure we discussed in an earlier episode that the trimarans were able to break the 30 knot barrier in testing. So I went on BoatTrader.com and I checked. According to them, personal watercraft like jet skis have top speeds that vary from about 40 miles per hour to 70 miles per hour, which translates to 34 to 60 knots. They did say, though, that if you're going faster than 50 miles per hour or 43 knots, then you are pushing it. (laughs) Like 50 should be fast enough on the water. Okay, so let's take into account that these jet skis are not well maintained. They're putting off an awful lot of black smoke. Mm -hmm. So there's no way they're going to get to peak performance type speeds. Yeah. They still have the potential to catch up. Exactly. So that tells me that the Mariner shifting his focus from escape to disabling the slower boat is not so much about vengeance for stealing limes, even though I love that as the framing behind him doing this to the drifter. But it's also, like we discussed with Cass, if you are running from a bear, you trip the slower person and the bear will get the slower person. So I kind of want to dive a little bit into the Mariner's mindset of tripping up the drifter so that the drifter is the easy prey. If they had had a positive interaction, Mm -hmm. if the drifter had not stolen from the Mariner, if they had traded and done everything according to the code, would the Mariner still have done this to him? Hmm. Personally, having watched the movie and knowing what a cranky butt the Mariner is, I think yes. I hate to think that way because I do want the Mariner to be a hero, but I have to agree with you. Which disappoints me, but at the same time, in this world, in water world, what choice does he have? Exactly. What choice does he have? And even if he doesn't purposely disable the drifter, the only way the mariner is going to survive is by going fast. By doing so, he's going to outpace the drifter. The drifter is going to end up closer to the smokers anyways. So what's the difference? Yeah, I think... If the Drifter and the Mariner had had a positive interaction, the Mariner probably would have sailed around the Drifter and left him to his fate, as opposed to disabling his boat and then leaving him to his fate. Yeah. And especially his you're dead meat throat slicing motion afterwards definitely like adds some more spite into that interaction Mm -hmm. that does kind of tell us he enjoyed it at least a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is it weird that when we see the drifter after all the float bag stuff that he's actively biting into one of the limes? No, not even a little bit. Like for one, he's no longer racing away because he thinks that the mariner is the easy prey and that he, the drifter, is safe. Mm. He stole six limes. He's probably really hungry. Yeah. He might as well eat one. And as far as biting through the skin of a lime, it's nutrients, it's calories, it's vitamins. You're going to eat the entire lime. Because, I mean, (laughs) who eats limes at all? Yeah. (laughs) Like, Like, is it just because this might be the first time that he's seen a lime? Right, maybe he doesn't know what he's getting into. Yeah. In fact, so he takes a bite of the lime, but the actor clearly is not actually taking a bite of lime and ending up with it in his mouth. Yeah. There's like a flap situation going on. Yeah, it looks like he bit far enough into it where his teeth started going into the rind, but it didn't pierce the full flesh. Yeah. Now, the character of the drifter looks very pleased with what has happened. So a couple things that I think might be going on. One, he's never eaten a lime before. He didn't know what it was. He just thought, hey, that looks edible. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take a bite out of it. Two, maybe it's not as sour as a lime that we are used to. This lime was grown in a little tiny pot. The flavors of fruits and vegetables do depend on what you fertilize it with. Mm -hmm. So who the heck knows what this lime actually tastes like? It could be on the sweeter side. So he could be delighted by the sweetness. 
even if it is on the sour and tart side, he doesn't seem faced by it. Yeah. If anything, it's a new flavor profile yeah, he that he's not used to. Very pleased. <laughs> but it's great to see him sitting there chomping on that lime. And then he turns around and he has to do a double take of like, wait, what? Because, <laughs> yeah, he didn't expect the trimaran to start coming after him. Yeah, he's feeling safe. And his sails are not full. No. We do get another classic Dean Semler type shot. After the drifter does the double take, we then jump over to the trimaran and we get an under the netting shot that is barely above the water, which is a classic Mad Max move so that the vehicle doesn't actually have to be traveling all that fast for it to appear to us to be racing along. And that is exactly the effect we're getting. It's beautiful. Absolutely. I love how this looks because they did it practically, because... You've got, obviously, all of this texture from the waves as they rush by, but you've also got these very clean shadows coming down through the netting. And as you watch the water, those shadows stay very consistent, despite there being so much turbulence in the water. And we watch a lot of stuff from the Corridor Digital YouTube page. And they do all sorts of CGI stuff. And CGI technology was still fairly new in Hollywood at this time. So there is CGI water in this, but nowhere near as much as like Titanic a few years later. And the Corridor Digital guys will talk about how if you ever see shadows over moving surfaces, those shadows stay crisp. There's no motion blur on those shadows and that's exactly how it is here there's tons of motion blur on the water none on the shadows that is very true and that's something you see in real world shadow scenarios like you get a little bit of wobble because there's wind going through the netting and the shadows are moving on uneven surfaces but they're crisp and like you said a great sense of speed and that leads us into the drifter cursing unintelligibly which It sounds a little bit to me like he's drawing out the word fudge, but it's probably just more Portu-Greek that they didn't want to translate for us. Curious about the whole Portu-Greek thing, Mm -hmm. about the process of making that up. Do the words actually mean anything? Did they take two words that mean the same thing in Portuguese and Greek and mash them together to mean the same thing in Portu-Greek? Or is it all gibberish? Or does it just influence... From the two languages to make a third that doesn't mean anything. I'm curious about that. I hope that when we get the making of book that it will get into the specifics of Greek. I like the idea of taking a Mediterranean language like Greek and mixing it together with a language like Portuguese, which I'm pretty sure is one of the Latin languages. I think so. So you get this idea that, of course, the trading language would come forth from the cultures that spent a lot of time trading around the Mediterranean. I like the idea of it, if nothing else, even if I don't understand it completely. (laughs) The drifter is completely frantic at this point. He is cranking his rudder back and forth, trying to squeeze as much speed out of his boat as he can. And I've never tried that before swinging the tiller back and forth to sweep the rudder in the water. Does that actually do anything? I mean, that's how fish move. That's a good point. Like, he's got the whole bulk of the boat, and then he's pushing water with the rudder. Yeah, so to make it work like a fin. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way he could eke out enough speed by doing that, though. No, but if you're about to die, you do (laughs) anything, any small little thing. That's right. He is panicking. He's trying to do any little thing. I mean, it's no good, though, because the trimaran does quickly overtake him and i love how the way that the mariner is turning the trimaran it lifts up that port float so that the span cuts very cleanly over the entirety of the drifter's boat oh yeah he aims and then the shot of the span cutting off the mast pretty much at the base so that all of the sails and rigging fall onto the netting is so good. Because, of course, if you can salvage anything while you're attacking, like, this is a two-prong move right here. Not only is he disabling the drifter, but he's also stealing his rigging and 
sales and things like that. Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised that there isn't some commotion and mess surrounding that procedure. Because mm-hmm. there are ropes that go all the way up to the top of the mast that connect down to the boat. So those didn't get sheared. There's no shearing action here. So there should have been some tangling. Some pulling on the part of that mast getting dragged back under the span. But it could be that the force of the span hitting that mast was such, not only did it break the mast, which is typically a very strong part of the boat, but it probably either ripped the ropes or tore the anchors from the side of the drifter's boat. So that way they just popped off. Yeah, I can see that happening. The drifter is not connected to his boat. He is just looking to level up. Mm -hmm. Also, this boat was a recent acquisition. So even if he was the sort to take great care of his boat and to strengthen it and make it better, he hasn't had the time. But I doubt he's that type. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have this image in my head of the previous owner being an old man who died of old age in the boat. Yeah. So the boat is probably in disrepair. So I can definitely see the anchors being yanked. I would like to think that if I was in this situation and I had enough skill and ability to sustain myself, if I came across a boat that was abandoned, I would take the boat that I have already and either try to combine the two or move to the bigger boat and then use elements of my old boat in the new boat as well. Yeah. I imagine that's how the eight holes got started. Yeah. Like people were on boats or rafts and we're like okay well we're stronger together so let's rope them together Mm -hmm. and then those turned into floating cities we're going to see later on in this movie the survivors of the atoll attack pretty much doing exactly that like they've all got their little boats and they're starting to string together a new atoll yeah it's just like in our society where some people live in cities and some people prefer rural living some people want to band together gather together closely. It's easier to share resources. It's easier to be cooperative. There's safety in numbers. And then there's people like us. Honestly, we would probably be drifters who we prefer to live out away from people. Any day that I don't see other people (laughs) is a good day for me. (laughs) I'm watching the drifter undergo this situation and his strategy is to hit the deck, cover his head, and not get smacked by the span. Yeah, I mean, that would kill him right then and there. If I were in his situation in reality, that's probably exactly what I would do. I would see this giant boat, compared to what I'm in, bearing down on me, and I would say, oh, I need to get out of this way before it lops my head off. That being said, couch quarterback Rick, sitting here in the safety of home, is wondering, well, why didn't the drifter climb up next to his mast and do like a strategic jump to then land on the trimaran. I was thinking the same thing. The daring self-preservationist mm-hmm. could have gotten away with that. Maybe not without injury because the trimaran's going awfully fast, but I think that might have been possible. Yeah. The thing that gives me pause about the jumping from the drifter boat to the trimaran plan is that you would be jumping onto, A, a speeding surface, but also that surface is made up of netting. And so the possibility of a limb going through that netting and then you sustaining injury because you just keep moving and your limb is caught in this net and gets pulled, I don't like the idea of being caught with a dislocated joint or even a broken bone in this world. It does not strike me as a good position to be in. And then aside from that, you've also now boarded someone that you stole from. Mm -hmm. And so you get a very high chance of A, being injured and then subsequently being thrown into the water and left behind anyway. Which is definitely what would have happened. I'm not sure that the drifter is intellectually capable of sweet talking of convincing the mariner not to do exactly that especially if he was injured Mm -hmm. you're right injured people in this world are huge liability even if you do your best to take care of them 
there's a decent chance they're going to die anyways from infection. And especially the Mariner, who, like I said before, is Mr. Cranky Butt, <laughs> doesn't care to take that time and effort and resources to nurse an injured person who stole from him anyways. Yeah. And the limes are still on the boat. He put the limes in the boat. <laughs> The smokers captured the boat. So it's not like he's going to get his limes back anyways. Yeah. I have to wonder, is the material that makes up the mast and then all of the rigging and sails that are attached to that mast, would that be an equal trade if the situation was mast and materials in exchange for the limes? And I want to say no. No. Because getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, in a while, the Mariner is going to make a trade. Safe passage for his life being saved. And he barely keeps up his end of the bargain. And that is the highest trade you could make. Save my life and I will do something for you. And he could barely manage to do the thing. <laughs> so an injury trade? No, I don't think so. And so the drifter is left. He shakes all this debris off of his shoulders. And Kevin Costner does that thing you described before where he points at the drifter and then drags his hand across his neck to say, ah, you're dead meat. Yeah. I particularly like about that moment, the enjoyment of the situation that the Mariner is finding. Yeah. Because this is justice. This. this is justice. Yes. <laughs> ocean justice. Tonight, 8 p.m. Ocean justice. <laughs> and this whole time, through this whole thing, he still has a lighter in his mouth. Mm -hmm. Which is weird. Weird. If you're in a situation where you need to put all of your energies forward, all of your smarts, your cleverness, your effort, all of your preparation into saving your life, and you still have a lighter stuck in your mouth. Hey, like, that, spit it out. That lighter is a consistent source of... A fire starting. Like that sparker, that spark wheel. Okay. It is very valuable. And the netting, he doesn't get to just toss things aside because he would lose that liner. It would fall through the netting. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. Plus, okay. there is mm -hmm. no way that his homemade pants have pockets. No. The Mariner is no, feeling no. the same pain that every woman feels every day when they look down at their pants and are like, these barely have pockets at all. Yeah. You know how often I have to actually hold my cell phone in my hand? That's why we walk around with our phones in our hands all the time. It's because we have nowhere to put them. <laughs> I do not have any pockets in my current outfit. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most glaring examples of the wasteful habits of the smokers is how when you see them speeding up to attack the drifter, the smokers are standing up on their jet skis and they're firing their guns at range. Gasoline is a rare enough commodity. I'm assuming that usable ammunition is equally rare. And the fact that they are spraying their ammunition all around is so wasteful. And I think that is just one of the qualities of the smokers that we're going to see laid out in this movie. I agree. And I definitely have thoughts on that that I will save for when we actually meet the smokers as a whole. Sounds good. Because there are other exhibitions of this wastefulness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and we very quickly leave behind the drifter. Like, goodbye, drifter. The last thing we hear of him is him going, ah, as he's getting taken out by smokers. Do you think he is killed? Oh, absolutely. Okay. There is no way they leave him alive. Okay. Do you think they ever recruit their prey? I think that if they find a big enough stash of people and they have the ability to get them back to the Exxon Valdez, that they will capture and enslave people. But I think it's important that there's a distinction between slavers and smokers. Good point. I think the Good smokers point. are all about destruction, where the slavers are all about taking people captive and selling them. All right. So he's dead. Oh, yeah. He's absolutely dead. Okay. But we don't dwell on him because it's time for another Time Passes montage. Ooh, where we yes. get to fade between some loving shots of the trimaran out sailing. And I wonder about the first shot we see. It's twilight. The mariner is standing out on the side float. And it's the side float that is high in the water. And it's bobbing up and down as it goes. And I have to wonder, is it better to stay on the high point 
where it's only occasionally touching the water or would it be better to be in the middle? I don't know. I have no idea. The only thing that comes to mind in regards to that is the amount of motion that you're experiencing and how that might affect any seasickness that you feel, which doesn't apply to the Mariner. Yeah. He does not feel any seasickness, mutation or not. He lives on the water. So he is definitely used to the conditions on the water. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Also, that's the funner spot. Yeah. Yeah, the more bobbing up and down, like riding the waves type stuff, that's the fun part. So it makes sense that he'd be out there? Yeah. Also, since it's only occasionally touching the water, there's not as much spray. So it might be the driest spot Mm. on the ship. It's a good point. On the boat. (laughs) And of course, we get that gorgeous shot of the trimaran in profile against the setting sun. I wish I knew how they made the sun look so massive like that. Like, is this a composite shot? Did they use a miniature? Is this just a camera trick that you can do? I don't know. I didn't actually research it, so I don't have an answer. But it just looks really good. My guess is that it's a trick camera shot. Like the zoom thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's my guess. And then the last image we get of the trimaran is it in trawling mode, and it's approaching the atoll. But what's interesting to see about the trimaran here is that it's got these canopies, and we mentioned the canopies during the passing time montage when he was underwater. But here they're actually up and spread out, and I have to wonder if these canopies are something that the mariner had before, or if these are just the remnants of the drifter's sails. Well, there's way too much canopy to be the remnants of the drifter sail. Yeah, his boat wasn't that big. It wasn't. I think these are the same set of canopies that we saw before. My question that I had about them is the method of them going up. Mm -hmm. Is their extension part of the automatic processes of switching from sailing to trawling? Or did he have to do them himself? I feel like those canopies are just loose pieces of cloth that he's able to clip into place. Okay. Like, he's going to put them away before he actually reaches the atoll, so I imagine he can just go around and unhook them, roll them up, and stash them in the hull. Okay. I like the idea of them, though, because it does provide shade in a situation where you would arguably never have shade. (laughs) Right. In reality, there would be a ton more sunburned people. In this movie. I think everybody has a very bronzed shade to them. So people are definitely adjusting to not having a lot of places to hide from the sun. But at the same time, it's not good for your skin to be out like that. No. Everybody should be a Louis Vuitton bag right now. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Especially someone like the Mariner who has a genetically fair complexion. With a parting look at the atoll, this chunk of minutes comes to an end. So when we come back next time, we get to return to the Mad Max tradition of negotiating entry into a compound. So how is the Mariner going to handle this? Because he doesn't have a Nathan to give, and he certainly doesn't have a pile of rabbit furs to exchange for a sack of grain or two hours with a woman. So we'll see how it goes. The Mad Max Minute podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. Waterworld was written by Peter Rader and David Tuohy, directed by Kevin Reynolds, and presented by Universal Pictures. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Irae by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MadMaxMinute. And like us on Facebook by searching Mad Max Minute and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit Patreon.com slash MadMaxMin. Thank you for joining us for Waterworld Episode 5. See you next time.